بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین ولاقب بطول المطاقین وصلاۃ وسلام علی سید الانبیاء والمرسلین اما بعد فقد قال اللہ تعالی في القرآن المجید والفرقان الحمید لقد كان لكم في رسول الله اسوة حسنة صدق الله العظیم ان اللہ و ملائکته يسلون علی النبی جا اجہ الدین آمن صلو علیہ وسلم و تسلیم اللہ مسلم علیہ سجدنا و مولانا محمد و علیہ آل سجدنا و مولانا محمد و بارک و سلم و سل علی ریسپیکٹڈ ویورز السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ و برکات آئی پری دیٹ دس ویڈیو ریچ از یو ان دا بیسٹ پاسبل ہیلتھ بہت فزیکل اینڈ اسپریچل ان شاء اللہ تعالی وٹ آئی وڈ لائک ٹو شیئر ود یو از اے بیوٹیفل ٹاپک ہیوی And this area that I would like to talk about is how Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam would fast during the blessed month of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us all to benefit from this particular lesson. Uh, you can imagine and you can understand and appreciate, I am sure, that our Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam is the perfect example for you and I. In the Holy Quran, our Lord instructs you and I to use His perfect and flawless example in each and every aspect of our lives. In particular, we should be taking His guidance and uh, rays of wisdom when it comes to how to draw closer to our Lord and worship Him. For no one was closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. No one could worship our Lord in the same way with the same dedication and sincerity than Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. So that is the precise purpose behind this program. It is to identify in brief what the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam's fast were like during the month of Ramadan, how he used to spend this blessed period purely with the intention that we can take on his beautiful sunnah and therefore draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, to begin with, uh, just a few important points about the fasting uh, in the month of Ramadan and then we will look at each stage of the Prophet Ali uh, Salatu um, Salaam's uh, behavior during the month of Ramadan. Fasting for the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, became obligatory in the second year of Hijrah. So fasting was not compulsory during the time in Makkah Sharif, but rather it was when the Prophet, peace be upon him, migrated from Makkah to Medina and then it was in the second year of Hijrah. So in total, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, spent nine Ramadans when fasting was compulsory upon him. And we also learn that all of these Ramadans, they took place in the summer months. So that itself uh, is a great feat from the Prophet, Ali Salatu was salam and his companions, to be able to fast during such severe uh, hot weather. Uh, so the actual fasting and Ramadan, that started in the second year of Hijrah. Having said that, even prior to that, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a deep and loving attachment with the beautiful month of Ramadan. And in fact, we know that even prior to his public announcement of Nabuwa, he loved this period of the Islamic calendar. We are told, for example, that it was in the month of Ramadan that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would sometimes practice khalwa, which means secluding oneself and uh, going to, for example, cave Hira and thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reflecting upon his beauty and worshipping him to the best, uh, 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 according to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had inspired him. Remember, it is in Ramadan that the Qur'an was first revealed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. This was in Makkah Sharif. So although the Prophet, peace be upon him, began fasting on an obligatory basis in the second year of Hijrah, along with his blessed companions, Ridwan al-Zhaqi alayhi wa ajma'in, please do keep in mind that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always loved this month. He always used this period to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even before 
fasting became compulsory upon him and his ummah. How did the Prophet ﷺ spend the month of Ramadan when fasting became obligatory? We will begin with the preparation period. The Prophet ﷺ loved this beautiful month and that is certainly reflected in how much effort he put in in preparing himself and his beloved companions Ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'in as early as Rajab. So we are talking two months before the appearance of Ramadan. The Prophet, peace be upon him, would begin to supplicate and pray to Allah. Allahumma barik lana fi Rajab wa Sha'ban wa balikna Ramadan. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give us blessings in the month of Rajab and Sha'ban, meaning the two months prior to Ramadan, wa balikna Ramadan, and enable us to experience the blessed month of Ramadan. You would also use this period prior to Ramadan to indicate to his companions the different rulings, virtues and importance of this month. So he would prepare them. He would prepare them in an educational manner. He would prepare them in a spiritual manner. There is one beautiful account which uh, Salman Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu has reported and our scholars have recorded in the books of Hadith in which the Prophet, peace be upon him, in the month of Sha'ban, he delivered a lengthy sermon, a khutbah, in which he explained so many different beautiful aspects of the month of Ramadan. And basically the purpose of this sermon was to prepare his companions, to remind them of how important this period is, so that they could take full spiritual benefit of this great gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this one sermon, and, uh, and I will share some points that the Prophet, peace be upon him, told his companions in this sermon that Salman Farisi has reported. The Prophet Ali Kassaratu Wassalam described Ramadan as a Shahrum Mubarak, a blessed month. He reminded his beloved companions that in this month there is a night, the night of Qadr, which is better than a thousand months of worship. He reminded the Muslims that when a person performs an optional act during the month of Ramadan, a nafal, then, owing to the blessings of this month, Allah increases the reward of that nafal act and he grants him the reward as if he has performed a fard act, meaning an obligatory act. So the reward is multiplied. And then, if a Muslim, our Prophet explained, performs a fard act, an obligatory act, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases the reward 70 times more. Allahu Akbar. Simple acts, yet such is the blessings of Ramadan that the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he multiplies the reward for you and I. He shows his rahmah and blessings upon you and I. In the same sermon, our Prophet, peace be upon him, described the month as a month of sabr, uh, patience. He described this month as a time where compassion becomes the leading uh, director for you and I. That each and every single one of our actions should be governed by leniency, by rahmah and compassion to the people around us. He reminded Muslims in the same sermon that it is in this blessed month that people's provisions are increased by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their rizq multiplies from their Lord. In the same sermon, he also encouraged Muslims to provide iftar in the month of Ramadan. And he explained that when a person provides iftar to another person, it leads to the forgiveness of their sins. It means that they will be protected from the fire of hell. And moreover, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward the person who provides iftar, the reward of the person's fast that he provided iftar to. SubhanAllah, great rewards for small actions. So in short, the period before Ramadan, our Prophet, peace be upon him, in himself prepared for it, and he asked his companions to prepare for it as well, physically and spiritually. Now we come on to the month of Ramadan itself, and we will begin by talking about the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam's pre-dawn meal, what we call the suhoor, or sometimes in Urdu what we call the sahri. For our messenger, peace be upon him, 
the suhoor was unbelievably important. And in many of his sayings, he stressed time and time again the importance of engaging in this meal to consuming it. In personally speaking, the Prophet ﷺ's suhoor was unbelievably simple. And certainly it cannot be uh, considered as lavish like sometimes you and I do when it comes to suhoor. We are told that the Prophet ﷺ's suhoor consisted of a handful of dates, sometimes only two dates, and some water. Subhanallah. And the Prophet ﷺ would be able to fast throughout the whole day and remember in the summer months as well with only two dates sometimes and some water. How did our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam manage to keep a fast with such a simple suhoor? How is it possible? The scholars of Islam have given many different reasons of how the Prophet Wasallam could survive on such a small amount. But what uh, they certainly say is we can summarize it in three simple points. Number one, the Prophet Ali could survive on a simple suhoor throughout the whole day because he was unbelievably physically strong. He was the most perfect human being ever to have existed. He had a complete balance in, in his life. Physically, he, he was perfect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who, who gave him that strength. And in one famous hadith, our Messenger, peace be upon him, actually said those words and he said, rabbi wa yaskini. It is my Lord who provides me with food, it is my Lord who provides me with water. So our Prophet Ali was unbelievably physically strong, spiritually strong, and that is why he could survive for such long periods of time without food and water. Number two, why and how could the Prophet Ali survive a whole fast just on some simple dates? Quite simply, dates are brilliant and excellent Ramadan food. They are really suited for the month of Ramadan, whether it is suhoor or whether it is the evening meal in the form of iftar. Dates by nature, they are low in fat, they are high in fiber and they are uh, rich in calcium and protein. Because they are high in fiber, then they can provide energy throughout the whole day. So dates are a perfect food for you and I as well in order to complete our fast, in order to get the full benefit of fasting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The final reason, and this is quite important too, of why the Messenger sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam was able to survive the month of Ramadan on a very simple suhoor was because he made the habit of eating with others. He did not perform his suhoor alone. He loved sharing food with others. And what he did was he explained time and time again that when Muslims share their food together, then Allah puts barakah in it. Barakah means blessings. Barakah means when food is seemingly only sufficient for two people, but when it has barakah in it, in reality it satiates and it uh, fills six people. When you eat together, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ensures that no one goes hungry. There is blessings in it. So because the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam would eat with other uh, of his family members and respected companions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in it. So it, it, it uh, lasted longer, you could say. This is very important for you and I in this day and age inside the month of Ramadan and outside. When opportunities come to eat, we must always eat together. When we eat together, then Allah puts barakah in it. When we eat and we take the name of Allah by reciting Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts blessings in it. May Allah enable us to act upon this beautiful sunnah of our messenger, peace be upon him. In terms of the timing of suhoor, the Prophet وسلم, delayed it as much as possible, meaning he kept it as close as possible to the time of dawn, which is the end time for eating. And thereafter he would perform Fajr prayer. 
One particular report says that the Messenger sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam's uh, um, stopping eating and the time of Fajr was the time that it took to recite 50 verses from the Holy Quran. So in other words, he delayed it as much as possible. This itself shows two things. Number one, it shows that as the Rahmatan lil alameen, the mercy for all mankind, the Prophet, peace be upon him, wanted ease for you and I. He didn't want us to perform suhoor, the sahri, so early that a person has to keep a fast for longer, that it would mean that it would be much, much longer hours. He wanted to keep it as short as possible, and that meant keeping the fast at, uh, up right up until the dawn time. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, the Prophet ﷺ delayed the suhoor as much as possible so that he and all of his companions could perform Salatul Fajr as well. It does not make sense that a person performs a suhoor very, very early and then as a result goes to sleep and he misses Fajr prayer. So that we take the full benefit of the month of Ramadan, the Prophet wasalam asked you and I to delay the suhoor so that we could perform Fajr as well. So this is a small uh, example and a small outlook into how the Prophet wasalam would perform his suhoor. Now we go on to the daytime and what the Prophet, peace be upon him, would do during the month of Ramadan. Uh, I, I will summarize it in, into three or four simple points about what Prophet Muhammad wasalam would do during the daytime whilst he was fasting in the blessed month of Ramadan. One important lesson and sunnah that we note from his blessed life is that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would recite the Qur'an in abundance during the daytime and nighttime indeed in the month of Ramadan. In his own prayers, for example, he would spend the uh, much longer in the Qiyam standing position so that he could recite as much as possible from the Holy Qur'an. Subhanallah, in one report we are told that the Prophet wasallam recited all of Surah Al-Baqarah in the first rakat of one of his prayers, Allah Akbar. The Prophet wasallam would also recite the Qur'an at night. Then he would listen to others as well. One companion, Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala was unbelievably lucky in the sense that uh, he had the honor of reciting the Qur'an and the Prophet wasallam would listen. Then we see that the Prophet wasallam would revise the Qur'an, meaning reading it to one another. Again, he would do this with the companion Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu ta'ala and Subhanallah, we are told that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would also revise the Qur'an with the angel Sayyiduna Jibreel alayhi salam. Every Ramadan, they would revise the Qur'an to one another, recite to, to one another. In the last year that the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam um, was on earth, they revised the Qur'an twice during the blessed month of Ramadan. So the first thing that the Prophet والسلام, certainly did during the blessed month of Ramadan is increase his Quranic recitation, whether that was reciting it himself or whether that was for hearing it from others, whether that was a form of revision. The other thing that we note about the behavior of our Prophet, peace be upon him, in the blessed month of Ramadan Subhanallah was his generosity. We must make it abundantly clear that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was the most generous person ever to have existed. His, his, his generosity dumbfounded people. They were astonished by the way that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would give and give and give. And this quality was to be found even before the public announcement of Nabuqwa. Sayyida Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha when the first revelation came to our messenger, peace be upon him, uh, said to the Prophet in famous words which Bukhari has recorded in his Sahih, that, Ya Rasulullah, this is Allah's karam upon you, for you are most generous. The non-Muslims, they admitted to how generous he was. But subhanAllah, somehow he became even more generous during the blessed month of Ramadan. 
He would be even kinder to the poor. He would provide them with food and water whenever he could. He would release prisoners of war captives that were kept with him during the month of Ramadan. Again, a very important lesson for you and I. If we are giving up the two most important things which are essential for our survival, food and water, then we should also increase our spiritual qualities within us. And perhaps our generosity is something that we should also be sharing with others during the blessed month of Ramadan. Other things that our Prophet Ali would do during the uh, daytime in the month of Ramadan, he would still use the miswak. Uh, miswak is a, a stick uh, found from uh, trees in the Arab Peninsula which act as a toothbrush. But perhaps more importantly, they do not only clean the teeth, but they strengthen the gums as well. And they please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. During the daylight hours of the fasting month of Ramadan, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam would still use the miswak. He would cool himself down as well if needed. As you can imagine, some of his fast must have been unbelievably difficult owing to the severe hot weather in the Arab Peninsula. So our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to create ease for you and I. So it would be a sunnah. On occasions he would pour water over his blessed head in order to cool himself down. On other occasions we are told that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would damp a cloth and place it on his blessed head. So when Ramadan does occur in particularly uh, hot days, to cool ourselves down is the sunnah of our messenger sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Sometimes it happens to you and I that in the month of Ramadan we need to travel, perhaps abroad, perhaps out of our city. And we know very well that the Holy Quran, through its compassionate and merciful nature, has allowed us to um, not keep a fast during this period. The Quran says, oh, ala safarin min ayyamin ukhar. That fasting is obligatory, but if a person is ill, or if a person is fast, um, traveling, then they can make up for the fast later after the month of Ramadan. So the Quran has allowed this ease. The Quran has allowed this mercy upon the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. From the accounts of the blessed life of our messenger peace be upon him we learn that our messenger did travel during the month of ramadan he traveled for example on the occasion of badr he traveled on the occasion of the conquest of makkah fatih makkah in the eighth year of hijrah and he also traveled in on the occasion of the battle of tabuk the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam on occasions did keep a fast and on occasions he broke his fast or did not keep a fast. And he did so keeping his ummah in mind. So that if we travel and we are finding it difficulty, then there is a precedence in the sunnah of our messenger sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam to um, uh, abstain from fasting, but importantly to make up for it after the month of Ramadan. Now we come to the iftar of Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. When the time of Maghrib prayer came, which is the time to open the fast, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would instruct one of his companions to go to a higher part of Medina Sharif and to look at the sunset. And when the sun had disappeared, immediately thereafter, that companion's responsibility would be to inform the Prophet and the companions that the sun has set and therefore it is the time of iftar. Immediately thereafter, the Prophet, peace be upon him, would perform his iftar and he would instruct his followers to do the same. So in short, there would be no delay between the setting of the sun and the opening of the fast. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the reports that we have never performed Maghrib prayer until he had ate something. So the breaking of the iftar always comes first, then the Maghrib prayer. This is quite an important uh, teaching uh, in itself. We should not think that Maghrib prayer takes precedence over our iftar. 
The iftar is more important and certainly this was the regular practice of Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. At the time of iftar, our messenger peace be upon him reminded Muslims that this is a time of acceptance. You have worked hard in order to please your Lord. So our messenger peace be upon him encouraged his companions, you and I as well, that this is a time to raise your hands and to pray to Allah, to pray for all of your needs. To, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our fast. So the time of iftar was also a time of du'as. And that is in addition to the regular du'a that our Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed upon completing his fast. Allahumma laka sumtu wa bika amantu wa alika tawakkaltu wa ala rizkika aftartu. Like his suhoor, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would perform his iftar collectively with his beloved family members, with the beloved companions. And again, like his suhoor, the Prophet ﷺ would break his fast with dates, with water, and on occasions he would also drink milk. Just like we explained that dates are beautiful and brilliant food for the suhoor, we are told by medical experts today that dates are unbelievably perfect for the time of iftar as well. After a person has kept himself hungry throughout the day, at the time of iftar, just prior to that, his glucose levels are at their lowest. Dates are brilliant food to ensuring that the glucose levels are quickly and safely returned to the human body. The time of iftar is a time also when a person feels dehydrated. Dates contain potassium, and potassium is brilliant in hydrating the body once again. So just like dates are an ideal type of food for our suhoor, our sahri, it is also an ideal food, medically and spiritually speaking, for the time of iftar as well. Importantly, and this has been mentioned in our books as well, as the sunnah of our messenger sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, that the messenger, peace be upon him, at the time of iftar, drank water slowly. He did not rush it. He took his time over it. The last thing we should be doing at the time of iftar, although we are thirsty at that time, is to gulp the water down, for this causes havoc upon our breathing and upon our um, uh, system. So we should drink water at all times in a calm and collective manner, taking three sips. Uh, we come to Salatul Tarabi. This is the stressed Sunnah of our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Our Messenger, peace be upon him, loved performing Salatul Tarawi. It was only on a few occasions that our Messenger, peace be upon him, did not perform this prayer. And the only reason he left it is so that it would not become a burden upon his Ummah. He knew very well that if I complete all of the Salatul Tarawis in all of my Ramadans, then it would reach the rank of Fard upon my Ummah, which might be difficult. From the books, we learn that the Prophet والسلام, on occasions did perform Salatul Tarawi collectively in Jama'ah with his blessed companions, and then he performed it alone thereafter. So both examples are there uh, for us. It was in the time of Sayyidina Umar that Salatul Tarawi in Jama'ah became a beautiful uh, example which we follow to this day and age as well. In terms of how many rak'ats the Prophet Ali wasalam, performed, the majority of the scholars unanimously agree, in particular the scholars of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that Salatul Tarawi consists of 20 rak'ats, and this is exactly what the Messenger wasalam, uh, performed. The final 10 days. It is important that I mention what the Prophet وسلم, used to do in the final 10 days of the month of Ramadan. In short, the Prophet وسلم, would increase his worship, his dedication and sincerity to his Lord during this period. That uh, he, his, his du'as would become longer. His Quranic recitation would be intensified. His generosity would intensify. And certainly his attention to his Creator would also increase during the last 10 days of the month of Ramadan. The Prophet, peace be upon him, during this period would also perform i'tikaf, which is known as seclusion, 
in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his beautiful mosque in al Madina al Munawwara. This would take place in the last 10 days of the month of Ramadan. In the final year that the Prophet والسلام, was on earth, he did not keep the itikaf of 10 days, rather he extended it to 20 days. Importantly, although the Prophet والسلام's house and his rooms were part of the masjid, and we see that even today, that the final resting place of the Messenger والسلام, uh, is the Hujra Mubarakah, the sacred chamber of Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, which is also part of the masjid, of al-masjid al-Nabawi. But importantly, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he would sit at the kaf, then he would do so not in his room, but in the actual parts of the mosque. We are told that a tent was put up for him, a leather tent, and the messenger, peace be upon him, would spend his time in the worship of Allah in this tent. He did not do an itikaf of silence. He still conversed with people. For example, when it came to indicating the different signs of Laylatul Qadr, our messenger, peace be upon him, would still talk to people. If people came to him with questions, rulings, queries about the month of Ramadan and how to fast, the messenger, peace be upon him, would also answer those questions. So, itikaf by nature is not an itikaf of silence. You are still allowed to talk, but obviously your talk and your conversation has to be purposeful. It has to be something which pleases Allah and His beloved Messenger. The penultimate thing I want to talk about is Laylatul Qadr. Uh, time and time again, throughout the whole month, the Prophet wasallam stressed the importance, value and superiority of Laylatul Qadr. He helped the companions to identify different signs by which it would be manifest to them that this is the night of Laylatul Qadr. Remember that the Prophet Ali told us that it is one of the odd nights in the final 10 days of the month of Ramadan. So it can be on the 21st, the 23rd, the 25th, the 27th or the 29th. But to help them further, he would give them indications, sometimes about the weather, sometimes about certain movements about which particular night Laylatul Qadr might be falling upon. The Prophet, peace be upon him, on the night of Qadr, would spend most of his time in supplications, in du'as, in prayers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he encouraged you and I to do the same. One of his most common du'as was, Allahumma inna ka'afuun tuhibbul afwa fa'afu anni. That, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, indeed you are the forgiving. You love forgiveness, so please forgive me. So this is also a beautiful dua that you and I should be reciting on the night of Qadr, indeed throughout the whole month of Ramadan. The final thing I want to talk about is the, the night of Eid, uh, what we call Chandrat. Uh, for us, unfortunately, this is a time of uh, uh, festivity. It is culturally now, it is a time of fun and joy and almost forgetting the important lessons of Ramadan, may Allah protect us. We should remember what the Prophet, peace be upon him, did on the night of Eid. He spent it on the Musalla praying to Allah. And he did so that it would become a sunnah for you and I. Once you have done all of this hard work, that for hours and hours, sometimes up to 19, 20 hours a day, keeping yourself hungry and thirsty for 30 days, the first thing we should be doing is to pray into Allah that please accept our efforts. That even if one fast is accepted by you, then it means Jannatul Firdaus for us for, for eternity. But on the other hand, if we have kept ourselves hungry and thirsty, but there is no Qabuli yet, there is no acceptance from our Lord, then all we have done is, is ruined ourselves in this world and in the hereafter. This is reflected in the last moments of the month of Ramadan, the beginning part of Shawwal. That night is so pivotal and important in, 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 in showing that we are missing Ramadan, that it was special and unique to us, that it was valuable to us. And the best way we can be doing that is serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, praying to Him, supplicating to Him that may Allah accept our sadaqah, may Allah accept our generosity, our Quranic recitation, and certainly our fast during the month of Ramadan. So this is a very uh, simple uh, outline of how 
Prophet Muhammad, the best of all creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, spent the month of Ramadan. And I hope and I pray, may Allah give myself the ability first and foremost, that we too can replicate some or all of it during our month of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our worships during this period. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. Ameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.